Hi, everybody. Welcome to Introduction to Humanities. I think this class is quite a bit of fun. Uh, we are going to study the humanities um, through the Greeks and the ancient Romans and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Uh, eventually, we'll look at modernity and we'll get to postmodernism and contemporary society. Um, we will be doing this um, with a textbook uh, titled Landmark in the Humanities, uh, the fourth edition by Gloria K. Fiaro. Um, the bookstore will carry them. However, I think you will find uh, other versions for a better price on Amazon, um, is, is what I've noticed. And we'll be using the fourth edition. So the class is asynchronous on Canvas. Um, each week, I will send you an announcement, probably Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, talking about what we've learned, um, how to tie those ideas together with other things that we've learned, and then what we'll be studying in that week and what the assignments will be. Um, the... The class, I think, is pretty fun. Um, in this class, we get to study the origins of philosophy and music and literature and art through history. Uh, we start at about 40,000 years ago. In fact, we'll start there today. Um, the first chapter in our textbook by Gloria K. Fierro is uh, a fairly lengthy one, not in, the, in terms of the amount of pages, but in terms of the amount of history that's being covered. We are looking at around um, 40,000 years of history uh, in our talk today. Uh, my name is Michael Hansen. I'll be your instructor. And I'm an artist. I go by Hansen typically. But you're free to call me whatever you want. Um, Professor Hansen, whatever you need. It's cool. This is me painting in, 19, in 2019 at the Sunken City in San Pedro. Um, I was taking house paint and putting it in Ajax dishwashing liquid bottles, and then I would pour that paint out, and I would either use a flat brush to, um, to paint a flat area, or I would drip the paint to make all the outlines and all the details. And then this uh, particular video of me was from a filmmaker that kind of stumbled upon me right when I was finishing uh, one morning. I usually paint all night, but the, the footage is, is pretty uh, awesome. Um, I'm painting on a street that had fallen about 50 feet and is going to continue to fall uh, into the ocean. This is part of a graphic novel that I wrote um, about the end of the world. I was writing about how the end of the world is coming, what is it going to be like, uh, and then did 108 of these paintings, and I think of it as a graphic novel, actually. So I paint, um, I write, um, and I think that much of my artistic practice is informed by the things that we're studying this semester, um, by studying literature, studying film, studying art, studying history, um, studying psychology. You know, all of these um, academic terms, uh, all of these academic fields uh, are ripe to be internalized and used as art. And that internalization is another thing that we'll be looking at this semester. What is the role of the individual versus the collective? And we'll kind of see how that changes in time as well. We don't have office hours, um, but you can contact me through the inbox on Canvas. Uh, write me. I usually get back to you within a couple of hours. I'm here for you. I want you to do well. I guess the most important thing for me is I want you to find stuff 
that you think is really cool, really interesting, and that will stick with you, that you'll remember, that you'll find some meaning in, or that you'll find some idea that you relate to that you didn't ever hear maybe particularly articulated in such a way before, that you can articulate it yourself and use it yourself as an idea uh, or, or whatever it is. That's, that's what I hope. I want you to have a lifelong appreciation for the arts. I think that that's a, a, a very important thing to have. And I don't know how many classes that you'll be getting in that. So to me, this class is very important. Um, I sign off typically as Hanson, your friend. Um, and this is because of a former uh, Los Angeles Dodger baseball player, Yasil Puig, um, who signs off as Puig, your friend. And I like the way, I, first of all, I like the sentiment. And second of all, um, I like that Hanson, your friend, sounds better than your friend Hanson. Um, and I like that it comes from this particular hashtag uh, in social media. I think that also... Uh, and something also that we get to study a little bit in this class is media, the effect of media upon us. And in postmodernism, we basically believe that our whole sense of the world comes primarily through media, through the internet, through television, um, especially electronic media, I would say today. Um, I'm speaking to you through electronic media. Um, the materials that I have made, I have gathered through electronic media. Um, and perhaps I'm actually human or I am some sort of AI. So what you want to do once you've entered the home is if you want to get started, you can go to modules here or in your navigation bar on the left in Canvas, go to modules. <clears throat> So the modules, I have the whole eight-week course set out here. Um, so I have the introduction that I've kind of already given you. Uh, we got Saddleback Resources. This is what you do to get started for the class today. I have what is due also up here, and then our syllabus. <clears throat> now, the syllabus, for the most part, is already here on Canvas. Um, so all eight weeks are here in front of you. So for our first week, now this is a summer class, um, and the summer class is eight weeks, uh, and normally the semesters are 16 weeks. So we got to jam a lot into these eight weeks. Um, in your textbook by Fierro, it's a great textbook, um, Landmarks in Humanities from Gloria K. Fierro. And uh, it's got full color pictures in it through the entire, the entire book is um, filled with images and paintings and architecture and maps and stuff. If you get this book on Amazon for $22, I'm not sure $22 even covers the, um, the cost of printing this. It's 460 pages. So our first chapter, and I showed you the very first image of the Sphinx and the, uh, one of the great pyramids. I'm assuming that's the Pyramid of Khufu. Yes, it is. Um, that's the book I want you to have. I'm going to take you through the textbook. Uh, and through the lectures, and I'll explain the first week here, um, and we'll be doing similar things throughout our eight weeks together. Um, the, uh, the first week, you might notice, we are only starting with one chapter, um, because I'm supplementing it with an explanation that is outside of the textbook, trying to explain to you uh, what the humanities are, because uh, most people don't really know necessarily what does that mean, what do the humanities mean. We will go over that, and there will be a multiple-choice quiz that will be worth five points. Then I'll go through the first chapter in the textbook, Origins, the First Civilizations, um, and there's a lot of stuff in here to cover. Um, I have a supplemental lecture on the development of writing from um, hieroglyphs, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, 
all the way to the Phoenician alphabet, which is the model for the Greek uh, alphabet. And the Greek alphabet is the model for the Roman alphabet. And the Roman alphabet is our alphabet, our A, B, C, D, E. That comes from the Romans, and the stylization is Roman as well. So there's a supplemental lecture here, mainly because um, the act of reading and writing, I think, fundamentally changes us as a society. It certainly changes what we know about these ancient cultures. As we look at the Paleolithic and the Neolithic era, I think one of the things that we realize is that we know very little about them because they didn't leave any writing. They left some beautiful paintings. There's some really interesting uh, abstract geometric marks that they're using, symbols that they're using. But in terms of taking how we speak and turning that into a written form and then using that written form for literature and law and mythologies and just um, recording, that stuff comes about 5,000 years ago. And I think that that development from 5,000 years ago from hieroglyphs and cuneiform, uh, the first really codified writing, into our alphabet um, at about uh, 2,000 years ago um, is a fascinating development and I think an important development to understand how we are able to access these cultures. <clears throat> after each reading um, assignment, after each chapter, there'll be a multiple choice quiz and then there'll also be an assessment. Let me click on this first assessment so you get an idea of what the assessment is. Um, what I'm generally going to ask in every assessment is what is your favorite part of the chapter? I'm interested in you. I'm interested in what you think um, of these things um, and why they interest you and, and how you come to find that this is the best part of the chapter in some way. Why is it meaningful? Um, the first chapter, we are going to see all kinds of early religious thought. Um, we're going to see belief systems that are forming. We're going to see different ways that gods relate to the human world. And then also how the ancient people relate to the dead, relate to their ancestors. Those are themes that we'll be looking at in the chapter. And the reason I pull them out is I believe that they are themes that we will find later as well that um, are continually kind of evolving. And I think that'll be really obvious uh, once we get into the fourth, fifth, and sixth chapters uh, and we see the Abrahamic religions. We see uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, and when we begin to realize that these religions are really pulling ideas from the, uh, the religions and the proto-religions that we're going to see develop today, I'm going to make a very strong case that shamanism and the Paleolithic world probably has a lot of the rituals and a lot of the ideas that start a notion of religion, that there is some spiritual realm beyond um, our ability to totally understand it and see it. Um, and people are constantly coming up with really creative ideas in terms of what that means and how these gods manifest themselves. Um, if you think about the Jewish God, the Jewish God is everywhere and invisible and intangible. And then when, say, you look at Greek gods, you find a God for explaining thunder and lightning. You've got a God um, communing with animals. Uh, you have a God explaining forces. Egyptian God Ra. Um, the sun is a chariot um, that Ra is taking across the sky. Um, so all these interesting explanations that come before science, that come before the telescope, that come before the microscope, um, that come before the typical understandings that we have of the world, as human beings, I feel like we've been trying to figure that out from the very beginning. And we're going to look at the history of us 
Homo sapiens, modern human beings, really starting at about 40,000 years ago, because that's one of the points where we can define us creating culture in terms of painting and drawing in caves um, and also carving figurines. The last thing for today is we'll have a discussion, and our discussion will be on cave art and the shaman practice. Um, the lecture will be much shorter than the first chapter, uh, and then the discussion will um, uh, include a number of these ideas about um, our relationship to the natural world. So let's start here with what are the humanities. I'm going to enlarge this on the screen, and uh, my face will disappear, but my voice will still be here. <clears throat> okay, so what are the humanities? Um, that is a valid question, and I have had a lot of students in the past um, start our class by asking that question. What are we studying? Well, the sentence that I have here to go with this slide, the humanities can be described as a study of how people process and document the human experience. That's probably the, the shortest, easiest way to say that. How do we describe what it is to be us? How do you describe, how do you show what it is um, to be you? And a lot of modern artists have tried to share that with us. I start with this painting here by John William Waterhouse, uh, Ulysses and the Sirens, 1891. Waterhouse is a British um, painter. He is a pre-Raphaelite, and he has taken on this subject matter of Ulysses um, from Homer's The Odyssey, the epic poem by the Greek um, poet Homer, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad that describes the great Trojan War against the uh, Greeks, that the Greeks will win. And then the Odyssey, um, which is the tale of Ulysses trying to get home from Troy and the gods interfering at every single turn to make his trip um, not a straight line, um, but quite an adventure. And I would say that the Odyssey is a very important piece of literature for other writers later on trying to write what is it to be in this country. Let's say 1950s Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Kerouac is a youth after World War II traveling the United States. And in this book, we get a sense of what it is to be in the United States by traveling through it and by discussing it. Um, and I would say that any kind of book or film that does that probably relates in some way maybe to the Odyssey. Now, what are we looking at in this particular painting from the Odyssey? So Ulysses is strapped to the uh, mast here. He's tied. His legs are tied. His arms are tied. His ears are open and he can hear, whereas his sailors have all covered their ears so they can't hear anything, and they're rowing, furiously rowing. What we're seeing flying here are the sirens. These are half women, half birds, and these sirens, they have this beautiful, beautiful song that they sing. And in this beautiful song, they draw you towards them, and what they're actually trying to do is draw you into the rocks with your ship, so your ship will hit the rocks and sink and probably kill all of you. So the sirens have this beautiful, beautiful voice, this beautiful song that you don't want to hear if you're in a ship because you will steer your ship to your death. So we're going to get out of there, right? Ulysses is going to get us out of there, but he wants the best of both worlds. He wants to hear this song as well. And it's the him wanting to hear this song, the desire of music, the desire of pleasure, 
of having pleasure when you're not really in a pleasurable experience. It's something that I think we can all relate to in some way. How do we, how do we get into our desires without destroying ourselves? might be the best way to maybe put this painting and put this part of the Odyssey and Ulysses into some sort of context for us. I think it's pretty cool. So, again, describing what the humanities are, modern humans use philosophy, literature, religion, art, music, history, and language to understand and record our world. And these are some of the things that we study in the humanities. It gives us a chance to connect up to society, to connect into history. I have a personal experience with this particular statue here, this bronze made by the ancient Greeks. So this bronze is about 2,000 years old. It's life-size. Bronze is a mixture of tin and copper um, melted down. Um, our ability to use fire to make the fire hotter by blowing air into it, allowed us to take clay and form it into ceramics, and then also allowed us to take tin and copper and to melt them to get into metallurgy and to begin to make better tools, better weapons, and better art, in this case, a bronze. The bronze is masterfully done in terms of human anatomy 2,000 years ago. We are looking at a boxer um, with his gloves on who has, he's completely exhausted. And he's looking, he's turning his neck and looking up at us. His face is covered in copper swelling and cuts on his face. His ear is completely swollen. His nose has been broken. And he looks up at us as if he is finished. He's defeated. He's be and yet... His body is powerful, but his spirit is, is beaten down from this. And you can feel it. And I stood next to this at um, the Getty in Los Angeles. The ivory eyes have been gone for probably centuries. And I looked into the cavity of the head, and I felt something. I felt a connection. Uh, I felt that history was alive and with me. And I felt that somehow I understood these people through this sculpture. That, to me, was a very great, important moment to me in my life, is, is to have that kind of understanding. So why study the humanities? Why should we study um, philosophy, history, literature, psychology, and polyscience, and not the hard sciences only? It's a good question. And I think we find in history artists who do both. Uh, this Leonardo da Vinci drawing of Vitruvius Man is an example of Leonardo da Vinci as a scientist um, and as an artist and uh, as a humanist. Um, we see his interest in the kinesiology of the body. We see his interest in the human body in relationship to geometric shapes. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was an engineer, and he was a scientist who was limited by the tools and the knowledge of science at the time. He didn't have the microscope. He didn't have the, um, the telescope. All he could do was use his eyes and study nature and try to understand as much as he could through observation. So what science does is science, we, we hope, is we learn that these are what things are. We get certainty from things. We know now that there's an entire invisible world and an entire um, universe that we can't see with the naked eye typically. Um, and that has helped us to understand our place in this world better. Yet what the humanities seem to always give us is uncertainty, doubt, skepticism, and what I think is questions. Questions always arise as I'm studying the humanities. The humanities are often subversive. They're often undermining the claims of authorities, whether it's political, religious, or scientific. 
I think skepticism is important when it comes to social media um, and us looking at the world because this is a world where we can get a lot of information very easily, but how much can we rely on that information? I use this particular slide to show you an image from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and I have a video. You may notice in these lectures that I have links, video links, on almost every single slide. So anything that you see here and anything that's talked about on the slide, if you want to learn more about it, I have linked maybe a couple of thousand um, links uh, this semester. Many of them videos, some of them source materials. Um, so in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, I think one of the things that we could begin to glean from this um, is that she's kind of asking us to think about science. And Dr. Frankenstein, Victor von Frankenstein, is a genius, is a great scientist, and he even is so great, he has the ability to reimagine the human and to reanimate human tissue, to bring back the dead, to create a monster, a creature. And I think Mary is asking us throughout most of the story, yeah, you can, but should you? And maybe that's also something that the humanities does, is it, it really asks fundamental questions about who are we morally, ethically, um, and what are our duties to each other, as well as our duties to ourself to figure out what our potential is. And maybe that's what Victor von Frankenstein was doing. Victor von Frankenstein had this enormous potential but he chose to squander it on a project that ultimately will lead to his destruction. This image here is, uh, I'm going to share a video of this. This is Jack Kerouac, an American writer. Um, he wrote one of the great American novels in the 20th century, On the Road After World War II, describing what it was to be an American uh, in the 1950s. He is part of the beat generation, the counterculture. Um, he is looking for an alternative to mainstream advertising American. Um, he is interested in jazz and poetry and drug use and living a life that isn't the life that um, perhaps uh, he is seeing on television in its infancy. I want to show you a a video, maybe one of the more interesting videos of the entire semester. This is a television show, and this television show is going to bring Jack Kerouac on to read part of On the Road. So for a television show, he is going to read. The host of the show is Steve Allen. Steve Allen is going to sit at this piano and he is going to play the piano. He is going to improvise jazz. Um, there is an off-camera band that is playing with him. So while he's asking questions, he's going to be playing the piano. And then when Jack is reading, he's going to be playing the piano also. In the background, there's a lot of strange paintings. I don't think the paintings are important that I know of in any way, but they're very modern. So we get this conflux here of television, of literature, of jazz, of painting um, in 1959. And I don't know in my history of media consumption if I've seen anything quite like this. the nation recognized in its midst a social movement called uh, Beat Generation. A novel titled On the Road became a bestseller, and its author, Jack Kerouac, became a celebrity, partly because he'd written a powerful and successful book, but partly because he uh, 
seem to be the embodiment of this new generation. Jack and I made a, uh, an album together a few months back in which I played uh, background piano for his poetry reading. And at that time, I made a note to book him on the show because I thought you would enjoy meeting him. So here he is, Jack Kerouac. told me a little earlier was nervous. Are you nervous now? No? Good. Jack, i uh, got a couple of square questions, but I think the answer would be interesting. How long did it take you to write On the Road? Three weeks. How many? Three weeks. Three weeks? Yes, that's amazing. How long were you on the road itself? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah, I was on the road once for three weeks, and it took me seven years to write about it. <laughs> He's not very I've impressed heard that you with these so jokes. fast that you don't like to use uh, regular typing paper, but instead you prefer to use one big long roll of paper. Is that true? Yeah. When I write narrative novels, I don't want to change my narrative thought. I keep going. You don't want to change the pages at the end, you mean? A hundred foot long teletype paper. Oh, teletype rolls. Where do you get them? Huh? Where do you get the paper? Yeah, the teletype paper. I mean, where do you get it? In a very good stationery store. I see. When I write my symbolistic, serious, impressionistic novels, I write them in pencil. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> I've seen a lot of your poetry written in pencil, but I didn't realize that's how you worked on the prose stuff. For narrative, uh, it's good. Yeah. Go I got okay, a, I'm going to move ahead here. Question of all, but everybody Let's just see a little answer. bit of him reading. I mean, because everybody... Gone. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast and all that road going and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it. And in Iowa, I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry. And tonight the stars will be out. And don't you know that God is Pooh Bear? The evening star must be drooping and shedding her sparkler dims on the prairie, which is just before the coming of complete night that blesses the earth, darkens all the rivers, cups the peaks, and folds the final shore in. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. Think of Dean Moriarty, or even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. Think of Dean Moriarty. Think of Dean Isn't it really fascinating to see how the writer um, reads his own work? If you just read the book, you might not understand the cadence of this, right? Look at the relationship to poetry, and that's where I think that the jazz accompaniment of this is really kind of astute, isn't it, right? It's like giving us a meter in which we can kind of read and kind of feel the words fit into the music. I think it's pretty cool. Um, and in this photo here, we see a photo of Kerouac and the teletype paper uh, and how he wrote, because he's writing on a typewriter. Um, and with a typewriter, you had to put it in one page at a time. And he has... I guess what I would say today is he hacked that. And I love the idea of hacking something. You all know of hacks and stuff on in memes on the internet, you know, how you might uh, hack a, a, a cup or something to make some super cup or whatever. Um, he hacked the idea of how you put the paper into the typewriter. Um, and that creative act in itself, to me, seems symbolic of someone already being creative before they start writing. By the way, that's a little bit how I feel about me taking paint out of cans from Home Depot and putting them into um, dishwashing liquid bottles, right? Like I have taken the paint out of its proper container and put it into a container it's not supposed to be in so I can squirt it, right? I'm making my own tools, if you will. And I think Jack is doing the same thing here. And again, I think that's an interesting part of uh, our human resourcefulness. Um, making tools is something we'll be talking about for sure in the next few minutes. Um, 
Let me see. I think uh, this is um, interesting here uh, in terms, again, of the humanities. That the humanities and social sciences teach us how people have created their world and how, in turn, they are created by it. And I think that's, that's a really good way to think about this. Now, this comes from Congress. This is a description of the humanities and how they fund it through Congress, through the National Endowment of the Humanities. Now, the image that we're looking at is one of the great sculptures that we'll be studying this semester by Michelangelo. Um, this is his Pieta. Um, this is a marble sculpture that he created when he was 25 years old, um, and it is beautifully lifelike, um, showing a mother holding her dead child, um, but doing it in such a way with um, grace and an understanding that the death of her child is leading to the salvation of humanity. Um, Quite, quite an ambitious um, sculpture, to say the least. So, from the National Foundations of the Art and Humanities Act of 1965, it says this. The term humanities includes, but is not limited to, the study and interpretation of the following. Language, both modern and classical. Linguistics. Literature, history, jurisprudence, which is law philosophy, archaeology, comparative religion, ethics, the history, criticism, and theory of the arts, we'll get a lot of that, and those aspects of social sciences that have humanistic content and employ humanistic methods, and the study and application of the humanities to the human environment with particular attention to reflecting our diverse heritage, traditions, and histories to the relevance of the humanities in current conditions of national life. Now, I don't believe that um, studying the humanities, necessarily the highest form of it, is making you a better citizen. Um, but there certainly is an argument that it does help you to understand your responsibilities, possibly. Um, I think that, that certainly has truth in it. But when I look at who it's written by, and then ultimately the summations for national life, I get why that is its concluding sentence, right? I, I look where it's coming from to understand really what it's trying to say. Now, there's stuff here I'm going to leave for you to read um, because uh, this video could let go on forever, and I don't want it to be too long for you. Um, but in these slides, I show you where the humanities begins with the ancient Romans um, from Roman Cicero, um, how it evolves into the Renaissance, um, and then how it shifts then from the Renaissance into the 20th century, um, and where we start to get to modern ideas and postmodern ideas. Um, this, I think, is a, a really um, uh, interesting part of studying media study from Roland Barthes. Uh, this image here is talked about in Barthes' book, Mythologies, from 1957. And it's a number of essays he wrote over a summer that talk about the social value systems that create myths in, Ameri in, in the modern world, in this case in France. So here, in an essay titled The Lion, he talks about this image on Paris Match, a um, popular magazine. And what we're seeing is a young boy from Algeria. Algeria is in northern Africa. He um, uh, uh, would be part of the colonies of the French. Um, and so Algeria is, to be Algerian is to be French. And so what we're seeing is this Algerian boy wearing a hat that you would have in the French military, saluting the French flag that is somewhere off of this shot. And what Bars is telling us is if you read this image, if you get critical with this image, what this image is telling you 
is that the people in the colonies love being the colonies of France so much that they salute, they fight and die for France, not for their own country necessarily. So this is totally an image of propaganda, right? These, this is a French publication that wants French readers to feel good about them um, invading and taking over other countries um, and having colonies. And I think that that is a, uh, a very powerful way that Bart has kind of um, uncovered this image um, to find not necessarily what it's um, saying on the surface, but what it's saying underneath that surface. Okay, so short lecture on the humanities. Uh, uh, what are the humanities specifically? And then a five-question uh, multiple-choice quiz. It'll be easy. Now, the, the real heavy hitter uh, for today's lecture. Um, chapter one, origins of the first civilizations. So the first thing you should realize is that this chapter, um, although it's only 35 pages, uh, it is really long in terms of what it's covering. It's covering at least 40,000 years of history, maybe implying even more. So we start at the beginning. We start in the Paleolithic world, um, which our textbook talks about starting on page 2. So in these prehistoric cultures, in the Paleolithic cultures, we're tribal hunters and gatherers. We are making stone and bone tools and weapons. And we find cave paintings and sculptures. So we are existing in an ice age where much of the northern hemisphere is covered in sheets of ice. However, this ice is creating a really fertile place for plants to grow, fresh water, um, and animals are thriving. Megafauna is thriving. Woolly mammoths, giant woolly rhinoceros, cave lions, giant horses, huge cows and aurochs. And what we are doing is we are following the animals and we are hunting them with our tools that we've created. So we are using stone to make um, spear points. Uh, we are making spear throwers. This is, that's what this is here. The spear is in here. This is a thrower that extends our ability to throw that spear probably an extra 50 yards. Um, we are inscribing animals and geometric shapes into our tools. So there is some point where Homo sapiens, modern humans, the thing that we do better than any other creature on the planet is we make tools. We hack things, right? We, we are able to take a stone and turn it into something. We are able to take a bone of something that we've killed and we are able to turn it into a tool. We are able to take the meat that is sustaining us and then use the hide and wear the hide to stay warm. So we are definitely um, part of the natural world. I would say we're also part of the food chain still. Um, we haven't quite figured out uh, exactly how to keep out of the food chain other than fire seems to keep animals away from us at night. Um, and we have some pretty exciting tools that is allowing us to hunt. Also, what is happening sometime around 30,000 to 14,000 BP, which means before present, um, that um, dogs are starting to become our friends. We're starting to domesticate these dogs. And that's certainly something, the domestication of animals, that becomes a major identifying factor in the next era, the Neolithic. So Paleolithic means the Old Stone Age. And in this old stone age, we find 
um, very early um, human culture in paintings, in caves, especially caves in Asia and in Europe. That's where we've discovered them. I'm guessing we're painting all over the place, um, but it's in these deep caves where things are lasting for tens of thousands of years. Um, the caves would be dark. Uh, you're taking in torchlight, and then you're using charcoal or other pigments. Charcoal is made really easy by burning wood, and then the burning wood becomes black, and it'll flake off, and you can rub it onto a surface, like a stone wall, for example. Probably Chevy Cave might be the most famous of cave art uh, locations. We're going to look at Chevy in our discussion today um, in France. This is this really amazing uh, woolly rhinoceros with this super long horn here. The ears are in perspective, and I love the mouth. I love the, the characterization here. Almost as if you're traveling through this cave with your torchlight and you come upon this um, woolly rhinoceros and you're scared for a second, but then you see like, oh, just fooling. Hey, I'm here in the cave. I'm not real. I am a abstraction of reality. So what does it mean that human beings are observing the world? And in the caves, most of the images are of animals. Um, in Chevy. There's no full human uh, images. And in another famous cave in Lascaux, there's only one human image. Mostly the images are caves. Sometimes we'll find hand stencils or hand prints. Um, and we find some geometric configurations that we're not totally sure what they mean. But the animals we get, and the animals we're looking at in Chevy are all extinct. So this cave was used from 30,000 years ago to 20,000 years ago. And then there was a landslide that sealed the cave. And no human beings entered that cave until 1994, where we found this amazing trove of art. So why are we going in to these dark caves and recording these animals? Um, what does that mean? And to be honest with you, we're a little bit in the dark. Um, literally in the dark, like we're not 100% sure because there's no writing to tell us. We just know that this writing, this, this drawing, this painting was prevalent across the world. And some of these artists are as good as any artist today. And part of the reason is the people we're studying are us. This is who we are. Imagine who you would be right now if you weren't sitting uh, across from your electronic device, listening and watching me, um, you know, trying to teach you history. Um, what would you be if you were a nomad? Um, think about as a nomad, how much would you carry around with you? You wouldn't have a lot of possessions. You're moving all the time. You're studying the stars. You're understanding nature. You're studying animals. Maybe you wish you could be as strong as a lion. Maybe you wish you could fly like a bird. Maybe you wonder if one of these animals had your brain. Maybe they would be very powerful and the apex hunter. So these caves were painted for tens of thousands of years. Artists would go into these caves and finish artwork that was done 500 years before them. This is another one of the great paintings in cave art. This is in France in Peck Merle. And these are these two spotted horses. And what's amazing is the head of the horse. The head of the horse is simply the side of this rock here. There is no evidence at all that the artist did anything to adjust uh, the rock to make the illusion of this head. So the artists are going into these darkened spaces, seeing art made by people before them, sometimes 10,000 years before them. And then they're seeing in the rocks, the swelling of the rocks, the cut of the rock is making them see animals and they're drawing those animals in from their hallucinations. Here we see charcoal making up the mane, the discs when you see the dots in Paleolithic art. They are typically made by blowing 
the pigment onto the wall, like spray paint, basically. And then the same thing is true with the hand stencils. They're like a tag. They're telling us who the artist is from the handprints. We don't know if the artists are men, if they're women, if they're children, if it's everybody. We don't know if this is a rite of passage. We don't know if this is a theater where then your human shadow can interact with these animals. We don't know if this is a way to identify the animals, if this is a way to hunt the animals. Maybe this is a transformation or a spiritual space where there is some sort of religious ceremony that is happening here, possibly something shamanistic that is, well, I think about it like this in relationship to making art. I showed you me making art at San Pedro, at the Sunken City at night. I go at night to make my paintings because there's a hallucinatory part of working at night. Um, and something changes within you from working, staying up all night, and then when the sun comes up, you feel different. And my question would be, when you're going into these caves in the dark, hallucinating an animal, and then drawing that animal in, sometimes with incredible creativity and precision, how are you different coming out of the cave? How are you more creative? What do you see in the regular daylight world or how do you think in the other world that somehow this is a benefit to you? Um, it's kind of like learning how to read does something to your brain. Learning how to do math does something to your brain. And I suspect learning how to see animals out of your mind and put them concretely onto the wall not only puts you into the history of human creativity. And again, think about this, 10,000 years if we look at Chevy and human creativity in there. And that these art styles are the longest art styles in human history across the world for tens of thousands of years. That's how similar we are. We find great sculptures in these caves at times. Um, like these clay bison uh, that were made here. And the clay was bought, brought in from another part of the cave to be carefully placed in the area that it was placed in. We also find that around 30,000 years ago at least, human beings are carving. We are, so not only are we using stone tools and we're creating tools from stones, we're also carving these figurines. And these figurines, we believe, are, um, are not just rocks, not just dolls, if you will, um, but actually have spiritual qualities to them, like Kachina dolls uh, that um, the Zuni people, Native American people, uh, would have that I'll talk about in a little bit. I suspect that the, the Venus of Ellendorf here probably was had that same spiritual quality uh, put into it. Maybe it would had it put into it by a shaman who maybe gave it a spirit. Animism is something we see in Native American culture and in African culture that probably is something that existed in the Paleolithic world where there's a belief that everything has a spirit to it. Not just something living, but rocks also. And of course, like gnarled trees and rivers and stuff that we see certainly as part of the Shinto religion in Japan, another ancient warrior religion. So this Venus here is about four inches tall. The belly button was not carved. The belly button was in the rock. So kind of like with the Peck Merle horses, where the horse started with the head in the rock, we see the same thing here. No feet, but the knees, really well articulated. We see the pubic bone, the triangle of the pubic. And then we see a woman who is well fed, which is a really good sign in a nomadic society. Nomads generally don't get enough food to have a lot of weight on them. We see large breasts, and then she, she's cradling the breasts. We believe that this could be a fertility image that this could be an image encouraging healthy women, healthy children. And then the face is the mysterious part of this because it's missing. So are we looking at hair 
wrapped around the head here? Uh, are we looking at some sort of headdress? And again, because it's not a specific individual, but a general idea, maybe that's why we're more convinced that this is an image of some sort of spiritual power. Now, when we try to figure out the idea of these old religions and spirituality, it's hard to do. It's hard to look back 10,000 years, 40,000 years before writing and know exactly kind of what's going on. So what we do today when we try to study these phenomena, we go back to societies that are pre-modern that exist today um, or have um, very little contact with um, the modern world. The San people, um, the Bushmen, we still find shaman. We find shaman in Native American culture too. Let me show you this video because I think that this video explains quite a bit about what a shaman is. So a shaman um, is a healer. A shaman is a historian. Um, a shaman knows how to heal you by taking the spirits of the world and putting them in you um, or getting you in tune with those spirits. They probably also are the medicine man that know various herbs and roots and things that are used to heal. Um, things that we might find in Chinese medicine today still. Um, and we're also going to look at this ritual, at this ceremony. In this ceremony, a shaman is going to dance um, at night, again at night when weird things happen and, and strange things go on in the human mind. Um, when you're protected by the heat of the fire, um, and yet, you can't really see around you. It's almost like being in your own mind, in a way, at night. And then people are going to heal, be healed by this shaman through dance. So we are seeing here a history of religion or a history of spirituality. Um, we are seeing a history of dance here. We are also seeing a history of early music where people are going to accompany or get this dance started with their voices, with their hands. It's pretty fascinating. Let's, let's listen and um, you'll see from the text here um, what's being translated. I love this. Because we are dancing and dancing at night, we become different. I mean, how often do you think about um, how many people in Los Angeles on the weekends are going out to dance at night in clubs, in old warehouses, um, to trap and trance and house music and again having experiences where the music and the dance and the night is making you in some way become different and that difference is something that you hope will affect you in your regular life and again this idea that dance and the night and the shaman are spiritually changing you is very close to something that sounds familiar in modern religions, I think. So again, this idea of the roots of religion. Um, I, that video that I talked about, I, I imply that. In cave art, we find certain cave art and I'll show you something from Shivi later on today here in the lecture. So we find images like this in cave art. Most of the cave art is pretty 
is pretty obvious, right? Like a person, a bison, woolly rhinoceros, horses, right? They're things that exist in the real world. And then we find cave art of these fantastic images, this half man, half deer, um, that maybe represents the dancing shaman here, who notice has feathers in his uh, head in this dance. Shaman often will wear the skins of animals, um, the feathers of animals, and again are trying to get the energy of that animal into the community or into a sick person. And this idea of that transcendence of that change certainly looks a lot like religion. The next era of um, kind of development of humans um, is in the Neolithic, the new Stone Age. We're still using stone tools yet. We haven't got to metallurgy yet. We haven't learned how to melt metal yet. Um, so what we start to find in this era are giant stones. We've learned how to cut stone. We've learned how to move stone. We've learned how to set giant stones upright. And in the Neolithic era, in Gobekli Tepe, which is in Turkey, they discovered all these circular stone configurations that have these giant kind of tea-like stones that have animals carved into them. And this is on the top of a flat, barren plateau. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any city here. It looks like it might be a temple. It might be just for religious purposes. And the reason that I'm more convinced of that is because at some point, they spent a lot of time to make these. And then at some point, they covered them all in. They spent a huge amount of time and resources to cover them all up. So at some point, this was important around maybe 10,000 to 8,000 years ago. And then one day they decided we don't want this anymore and they covered it up. And because they covered it up is why we've been able probably to discover it in such good condition. So who are these Neolithic people? Well, we're finding civilizations starting to form around farming. Farming is really the big, um, uh, the, 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 the big change in human culture going from nomadic to being stationary, where we can build permanent housing. Um, we can have a permanent civilization rather than temporary civilizations. So at some point... Um, in 10,000 uh, BC, we find it early in the Middle East, um, these early civilizations. What happened? Well, we discovered that if you learn how to harness seeds, if you learn how to harness certain fruits and vegetables and grains, and if you plant them in the right soil at the right time of the year, and if you get the right amount of rainfall, that those seeds will grow, and they'll grow into food. And you don't have to search for the food anymore. Instead, you can begin to plan and grow the amount of food that you want. And in fact, you can grow so much food that you have a surplus, that you have food that you can trade, that you can trade for services. You can trade for someone to build you a house. And this idea of us now having a community that is stabilized by farming and is um, harnessing the power of animals. We've domesticated animals to be our beasts of burden, cattle to pull our plows, horses to um, carry things and us. Um, we have used these animals now as machines that are helping us to develop. And we are now if you will, lording over the animals rather than being part of the food chain, part of the animal food chain. And rather than wearing skins, we've mastered weaving fibers. So now we also don't have to rely simply on the pelts of animals. We can make our own clothes too. So this is a, a, a really like interesting time for human beings, right? Like we figured out something huge in terms of food. 
We also have found that we don't need to necessarily chase food around. Instead, we can domesticate the food, uh, make fences where the food can't wander away, and then um, you can constantly have a cow or a pig or a chicken or whatever. Now, one of the issues that I think is worth looking at in terms of the domestication of these animals is how much did we affect their evolution? So, for example, a milk cow. A milk cow has been, um, has been bred by humans to having such huge udders that when the milk fills up, the cow can't walk anymore and needs us to empty the udder of, um, of milk. So we have um, forced animals to evolve in ways for us to eat that are totally unnatural um, and probably wouldn't have been done if they were left to their own evolution. And of course, how many species have we affected their evolution? Are there species of animals who may have become of beings like us that never got a chance? Those are also good questions too. But what we're here to study is the human culture. So a Neolithic society, this is a, a small town and the way that the town was put together, Chattahoyak, um, which is also in Turkey. So in Chattahoyak, we find a community that is thriving through um, farming. Um, they are at this time also making pottery. They have mastered the kiln. Um, and then this particular um, uh, town here, they don't have doors outside. They build right next to each other and kind of right on top of each other. And to get into their places, you have to enter through the roof. So to get, to, say if you live in the middle here, you have to climb up the wall and then you have to walk across the roofs and then you enter through a ladder through the roof in your building. And I bet that that probably um, keeps a number of predators away. Um, but it's, uh, it reminds me a lot of living in apartments today, like you're right on top of each other. Inside of the homes, we find frescoes and paintings on the walls. We find dead buried in the, um, the apartments. Um, and we also find figurines. Um, the figurine here is really interesting, right? It's a powerful woman, well-fed, sitting on a throne of lions. We have some belief that Chattahoyak was a matriarchal society, um, or at least we see that men and women have um, similar social status. We start to find also gods, fertility goddesses, um, and the idea of the fertility goddess, I think, is a very important image uh, when you're a farmer, right? Fertility is a really important idea. Um, in the lecture, I have other Neolithic societies that we found. This is a house or a dwelling in um, Scarabrea, uh, which would be in Scotland, where they're actually building into the cold ground to keep them warmer. Um, and then also in Britain, uh, or south, I guess, of Scotland in Britain is Stonehenge. This is one of the more famous examples um, of us cutting stone, laying stones up, um, and configuring stones um, that are being used for ceremonial purposes, for ritual purposes. We believe that Stonehenge may be a place for healing, it may be a place for ancestor worship, um, and it may also be a celestial clock for farmers. Knowing when the shortest day of the year is, is a very important thing for farmers because you basically count those days to figure out when to plant your seeds. If you plant the seeds too early, they won't grow. If you plant the seeds too late, they won't grow. You got to plant the seeds at a certain time of the year so they get the right amount of rain, they get the right amount of sun to make food. 
Um, and again, that celestial knowledge is very, very important for our survival. We go from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age at around 3300 BC, which would be before the Common Era. era. So there's a number of ways that we're looking at history in terms of time. In the very first slide, I showed you BP, which is before the present. We also measure time in BC or BCE um, and then AD which is basically the, um, the Christian era. So in the Christian era, our calendar is um, uh, 2022. Um, in the Muslim calendar, we are in year 1400. Um, so there's a number of ways that we date the past as well. So right here, we are looking at a past rate related to the Christian calendar. So 3300 BC would be about 5,000 years ago. You tack on 2,000 years after that BC. Bronze. So with bronze, this is where we're getting into metallurgy. So not only have we mastered making ceramic pots to hold food and water in and um, to keep food fresh, uh, but we also have figured out how to take copper and tin and to heat it to a point that it melts. And then from that, we are able to make bronze. And with bronze, we are now making better tools, stronger tools for plowing, better weapons. And in this Bronze Age in Mesopotamia, we see a kind of new age now um, where we are learning how to write with a uh, cuneiform, um, we are trading, and in the Fertile Crescent, which is what we call Mesopotamia, so we're going to study the Greeks in our next lecture, who would be over here. Here we have Phoenicia, we have Jerusalem here, here's Egypt here. And then in this Fertile Crescent, where you have the desert on one side, these mountains on the other side, and then you have this valley that the rivers from the mountains, the fresh water, is allowing for civilizations to pop up. And these Mesopotamian civilizations, they share a number of things. They share similar gods. They share a similar environment. They share similar building techniques. And they're also sharing similar language. Um, what we see between the Sumerians and Sumer and the Akkadians or the Assyrians is widespread bilingualism. So speaking Sumerian and speaking a version of Akkadian is important in terms of if you're going to trade between the different cities that are forming here. Now, some of the cool kind of cultural production that you find in Ur, one of the earliest cities um, for the Sumerians, we find um, a kind of temple uh, called uh, a, a ziggurat, um, a, 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 not a pyramid exactly, um, but the ziggurats are made out of mud bricks. There's a lot of mud there in the desert to use. Um, they are dried and hardened, um, or they're fired in a kiln to make them hard. And those bricks have formed a ziggurat. This is a reconstruction of the ziggurat here. And then probably at the top of the ziggurat, you have a temple complex that is serving as an administrative center, probably a shrine. Um, this particular one, the ziggurat of Ur, is probably a shrine for the mood god uh, Nana. Um, and a patron deity of Ur. And probably then around this ziggurat, uh, you have probably marketplaces. It's probably a, a center point of the city. The bottom here, these figurines, I've seen these figurines in museums at various times and am completely enamored by them. So these votives are cut out of marble and they are praying, and they have these wild, staring, completely wide eyes that I'm really, really kind of blown away by. 
And these little votives are filled with spiritual power for you. So, you know, you can't, you're busy farming or you're busy trading. You can't farm 24 hours a day. You can't pray 24 hours a day. So these votives are standing in for you praying and they never stop. So you know that you are actively engaging with the gods with your votive, with your votive statue. In these ancient Mesopotamian religions, we find that they're um, polytheistic. Um, there are major gods, of course, gods of wisdom and magic, sky gods, gods of earth and storm and agriculture, controlling the fates. Um, these gods all have very specific functions, like the sun god Shamash. So here, in the bottom image, we have Shamash. He's always wearing the same crown, so you know it's Shamash. Here is a sun disk, um, the sun being represented here, and Shamash is seated, and Shamash, through his sun dish, is... Um, he is okaying that the, uh, the king, the Babylonian king here, is receiving the symbols of his being okay with this guy being the king. Um, so we are seeing in this image a, a acceptance of the transference of power. So why should this guy be king? Well, because the, the sun god said this is the guy that it should be. And you don't want to go against the gods, right? So these images that we find, this one is a seal. So this is in clay and is made from an imprint. It's basically a print, printmaking. Um, and this one is carved uh, into, um, uh, this is a bas-relief carving here. So there's a number of ways that these images are being made. Inanna. So one of the first um, goddesses that we have written records on is Inanna from around 4,000 years ago from Sumer. Um, she is the queen of heaven. She is the goddess of fertility, love, sex, procreation, life and death, war and rebirth. Um, she is associated with rain, storm, with the planet Venus, with the morning and evening star, um, and is very similar to the, um, the Greek and Roman goddesses of Aphrodite and Venus. Now, these myths are being codified by writing. That writing, we find an example of that in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So this is the earliest epic poem that we have evidence of, dating in Ur from around 2100 B.C., or about 4,000 years ago. So in this epic, we have King Gilgamesh, and he has a friend, Enkidu, who is part animal. And Enkidu is killed off in the first half of Gilgamesh. And we look at this possibly as a metaphor for killing off the old religions, the old shamanistic religions, possibly. In the second half of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh wants to retrieve his dead friend and goes into the land of the dead. And he is going into the land of the dead to retrieve Enkidu. And what he finds out in this, and of course, a great king has the possibility in this great long gone era um, to get to the land of the dead, right? Um, maybe you and I can't figure out how to do that. So he goes into the land of the dead and finds out that, you know what? When you're dead, you're dead. That's the thing about being human is humans die and humans don't come back. And again, it's a, a really interesting mythology, right? It's talking about a great era of the past. It's talking about um, relationships with nature in the past. But most importantly, it's explaining to you that death is a finality. There's some great art that we find in Mesopotamia. Not a lot of it, 
um, because the um, the environment is um, is pretty harsh. So anything that is wood or anything else is recreated. So here we're looking at this lyre, this sound box that has the head of a bull on it. Um, we believe that this is maybe how this looked, but it's a recreation. We have found art on it, though. And on this art, again, the relationship to animals, where we see um, a, uh, a horse playing a lyre while a bear supports it, um, or a hyena carrying meat to a table, and a lion holding a jar and pouring a vessel um, identical to the vessels that would have been in the graves that this was found in. Or here, we're looking um, at a nude hero grappling with two human-headed bulls, representing royal control over nature. So, people are burying the dead into tombs, and they are putting great um, objects with them. So, we're putting gold, we're putting objects that took hours, sometimes hundreds of hours to make, and we're burying them in the ground. We are not keeping them in the society, but we revere death in such a way that we put very precious objects with them. And we are writing. This is what cuneiform, this is what Gilgamesh would have been looked like. So it's made out of clay, and then again, that clay is put into a kiln and fired typically. Cuneiform is made by pressing a stylus into the wet clay to make these unique forms that have either a pictographic representation, they represent something literally, or they have some sort of sound uh, quality to them that allows you to enunciate words. And so the oral, the mouth, now has a written accompaniment to it. I'm not going to go over everything again because the lecture is going to get too long. I'm just going to hit on some highlights. And when you read the textbook and if you look at the lectures, you certainly um, will get the information. Okay, so after Sumer kind of begins to lose power, uh, the North, the Akkadians, take power. Um, and ultimately, the Northern power is going to switch to Assyria in the north and Babylonia in the south, and they will both be speaking the same language. Sharing language definitely makes you feel that you are part of a community. If you think about that in the United States from east to west, people are speaking English, and signs are in English, which give you a sense that you're in the same country. So in Babylon, around 1754 BC, around 3,700 years ago, we find a stone, a stele, that has cuneiform written on it with the sun god Shamash handing the laws to King Hammurabi. The stele, the stele is in the shape of an index finger. So holding your index finger up is a sign that you're talking about law. And then these are the first written codified laws. So we're using writing for laws. We're using um, uh, writing to record um, what we're trading, to take inventory for accounting purposes. We're seeing writing used for registries. We're seeing like graduating classes having their names written on a, uh, on a piece of clay in cuneiform. Um, and then here, we're seeing kind of eye-for-eye eye, uh, laws um, and punishments. Um, and also, how do family relationships work in terms of inheritance, divorce, paternity, and sexual behavior? So we're looking at law in terms of what does a government do? A government is providing a place where people can expect a certain way to be treated. Now, the next great phase in terms of human engineering and production is in the development of uh, iron. Iron is much easier to make in some ways than uh, bronze because 
tin and copper is something that doesn't exist easily or naturally in a lot of countries. Whereas iron ore is everywhere. So in iron ore, they have learned how to melt it, how to make the iron ore hot enough to melt. And then the metal then is um, stronger than bronze. In fact, so strong um, that they're making iron plows, iron tools, iron pots, um, and of course, iron weapons, which are superior to bronze weapons. And the first great uh, Mesopotamian empire are the Assyrians with these iron tools. We see here an iron-wheeled chariot and the king on a lion hunt in this beautiful low bas-relief here done in the Assyrian style, which, by the way, there's a number of these at LACMA in Los Angeles. So the Assyrian Empire comes around with the right technology and also this interest in expanding its borders. We see from the Assyrians, again, some really great art and great sculpture. Um, these particular pieces here, the uh, man-headed winged bull from the citadel of Sargon II. Um, from the front, we see the standing half man, half bull with the beautiful stylized beard and hair. From the side, there appear to be legs walking. So it goes from a standing man bull to a walking or almost flying man bull on the side. Um, again, that idea of movement that we saw in the cave art. The last thing from Mesopotamia I'm going to touch on, again, because there's still a lot to go over still, uh, are the Persians and the Persian Empire. Here we see Assyria and Mesopotamia. To the north of it, we're looking at the Persians, where Iran would be today. And from the Persians, we get a type of religion that is talked about in our first chapter on page 15, Zoroastrianism. So Zoroastrianism comes from a religious philosopher, um, Zoroaster. He is simplifying the pantheon of early Iranian gods into two opposing forces, progressive mentality and destructive mentality under the god Ahura Mazada or the illuminating wisdom. So the creator Ahura is all good. No evil, evil originates from him. Um, good and evil have distinct sources now. Um, and then historically, the features in this religion, we have a single god, monotheism. We have a belief in prophets and messiahs a belief in free will, judgment after death, a version of heaven, hell, angels, and demons. And these things in themselves are definitely going to affect later modern religions, certainly the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We also in our chapter, which this could also be an entire semester, from page 16 to 23, we talk about Egypt. Now, the stability of ancient Egypt. We're going to talk about that in a second here. I just want to hit on some of the beautiful things that we found in ancient Egyptian tombs. Again, much of our history and our understanding of these cultures is coming from what they're burying their dead with. The musical instruments, um, the food, um, the art that they're burying their dead with. This was an intact pharaoh's tomb. Pharaoh is a king, an Egyptian king. And this was found in 1922. Almost all the other Egyptian tombs have been looted because people knew that there was precious gold, uh, blue lapis lazuli that could be melted down and resold. Very precious stuff. This is the death mask on the coffin of King Tutankhamun. And on the death mask here, we see that we have the cobra, 
um, and then also the vulture that are signifying the sovereignty of Upper and Lower Egypt. This would have been placed over the mummy of King Tut. Now, why is it so stable in Egypt? Here is an aerial view of the Nile, the river that runs all the way through Egypt from the northern mountains and floods out into the Mediterranean in Lower Egypt. Every spring, the Nile floods and floods a rich, nutrient-rich black dirt, floods the banks of this fresh water, and is quite fertile for farming. Look at how the deserts that surround the Nile are really, really harsh. But next to the Nile, you are able to live. And so think about this. Part of the stability of ancient, um, of ancient Egypt is, do you want to, as an army, do you want to travel across this desert and then fight a battle? And the answer is not really no. Whereas when we look at all of the changes from the Sumerians to the Akkadians to the Babylonians, we can sum a lot of that up to look how easy it is in this fertile crescent to go from one city to the other in terms of conquest. But traveling through the deserts to get to Egypt, not quite as simple, right? So ancient Egyptian religion. We have in Egypt, we have farmers, um, we have architects, we have scribes and writers, we have people who are cooks, we have people who um, are selling things in markets, um, and we also have a religious, a priestly class. And this priest class is giving you history and also setting up a hierarchy in how to get into the afterlife. So from the Egyptians, we get this really, really complex afterlife, and there are books of the dead, papyruses, that have Egyptian hieroglyphs on them that tell you how to get into the afterlife. And into this afterlife, you will be confronted by various gods. One of them is Anubis, here at the bottom, the head of the jackal with the body of a human being, weighing your heart against a feather to see if you've done enough good to get into a good place in the afterlife. So this fully formed afterlife and the gods. Let me explain how the pharaoh is the head of all of this. So the very first god is Ra. Ra is the god of the sun. Ra is depicted with the head of a falcon and then um, the body of a man. Ra is also often has a sun disk or a chariot. So the sun is not Ra. The sun is an object that Ra moves across the sky. But at some point, Ra became senile and couldn't run our world anymore. So his son, Osiris, is set to be the pharaoh of our world. However, his brother Set was jealous of his brother being the pharaoh and kills him cuts him up into pieces and scatters him all over Egypt. Osiris's wife, Isis, spends years finding the parts of her dead husband and then binds them in cloth to make the first mummy, but only comes partially back to life. And the reason is she couldn't find his penis. So he couldn't become a fully um, alive human and ultimately becomes alive and the pharaoh in the world of the dead. He is sitting in judgment over souls and appears as a king with blue skin and white robes. Now, Isis's and Osiris's son is Horus. Horus has the head of a falcon. Normally, 
it will be a image of Horus in a hallway that you will find in the dead. And Horus will lead you through the hallway to the judgment that ultimately Osiris will be presiding over. So Horus is considered to be the first pharaoh. Horus is half human, half god. And what this means is, is all the pharaohs that come after Horus are gods. So in other words, the reason that you don't want to revolt against this system, the reason that you keep this hierarchy of the pharaoh on top with the priests keeping the pharaoh propped up and also their place in society being important, um, all revolves around the mythology that the first um, uh, pharaoh was a god and all the other pharaohs therefore are gods too. So what we know really a lot about Egypt is from their afterlife, is from their tombs. And these tombs all have paintings, all have hieroglyphs in them, and the tombs are like reading, but reading in a room, reading in architecture, rather than reading in a book specifically. I think it's a really interesting relationship to architecture through the tombs. But what I find most interesting is the labor these artists put upon these tombs and then seal them off and bury them. We put a lot of stock into the dead, into the ancient world. There are some really great tombs that we still are kind of in awe in today. The pyramids at Giza in Egypt that were built by three generations of pharaohs, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaur. They built these giant pyramids that have four sides that relate directly to north, south, east, and west. And the largest pyramid of Khufu was the largest building in the world until around uh, 1500 AD. Um, so when these are built uh, around 4,500 years ago, we are talking about the tallest building projects in the world. Inside, you have the chambers that are the tombs that have been looted for thousands of years. So all we find in here really are empty galleries and maybe some uh, hieroglyphs painted. Protecting the tombs, mysteriously, is the great sphinx that has the pharaoh's headdress on and is the body of a lion and maybe acting as some sort of protector or guide or spirit for the tombs. Ultimately, though, because everybody knows that these tombs are looted and raided, they're going to change the placement of the pharaohs into the Valley of the Kings. And in the Valley of the Kings, we are going to have... Uh, um, maybe not as obvious burials as we do here in the pyramids. Uh, however, most of those tombs will be looted too. Really, the only unlooted pharaohic tomb that we found is the tomb of King Tut, a teenage ruler who dies as a teenager. One of the other things that I think is kind of cool here, just to touch on briefly, is because we have all of these papyruses and because writing is happening, not only do we have books of the dead, but we have books of all kinds of stuff, especially accounting, or in this case, literature, the teaching of Kete. Kete is about a, um, a dua Kete um, is uh, um, taking his son to scribe school to learn how to write. And the son really doesn't want to be a scribe. And the son is finding out along the way all the different occupations that there are, like stone workers uh, or um, uh, uh, somebody who is making copper, whose fingers look like the craw of a crocodile and who stinks from working with uh, uh, the copper. Um, or a farmer whose um, uh, bent, uh, back is bent from bending over all day. In other words, you look like your occupation. And the scribe, well, the scribe, you're going to get a little bit chubby. Your muscles are going to get a little bit soft. 
because writing is going to mean that you're not going to have to do the backbreaking labor. You are going to open up your mind. And as a scribe, very, very important people are going to um, use you to write important things. And by the end of the journey, his son is like, hey, you know what? Maybe being a scribe is kind of cool. Now, with for a brief moment, the religions that I've mentioned um, change under the pharaoh Akhenaten. Akhenaten is a pharaoh who changes the art into something not quite as stiff like what pharaohic art typically was, kind of really stiff, kind of warrior-looking sculptures of pharaohs, into here a slouching pharaoh playing lovingly with his children and his wife also kissing her child and the sun god, Aten, shining rays. So in other words, the sun went from Ra from being an object that the invisible Ra is moving to under Akhenaten, the sun, the object itself is a god. And so he try he changes the center of government. He changes the style of art. He changes the religion. And it doesn't really last very long beyond his death. Ultimately, we see the effect of that style in Tutankhamun in his tomb. Um, but ultimately, they are going to go back to the original gods. Now, the reason we know so much about the Egyptians is because in 1799, while the French are occupying Egypt, they find this stone propping up a building. It's a cornerstone for a building. And this stone has the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. It has a more modern version of Demotic writing and also Greek in it. So this is a translation stone that allowed us to translate all of the hieroglyphs. So all of these hieroglyphs that were unknown and people had forgotten about them for about 2,000 years, we know now how to read the entire history of Egypt through their hieroglyphs and through their writing. Now our textbook also briefly shows us that not only are great cultures existing um, in Egypt by the Nile, by the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, in Mesopotamia, but we also have great things going on in Africa. Um, great ceramics being made by Nak cult, uh, by Nak culture in Western Africa, um, by um, giant stone sculptures that we're finding in Central America, in Guatemala and um, uh, Southern Mexico, like the Olmec heads who are carving these giant heads out of basalt. And in Native America, we are finding thriving cultures. And I want to touch on the Kachina doll because they relate to the Venus of Vellendorf that I showed you in the Paleolithic era. So the Kachina is a spirit in Western Pueblo religious beliefs, and the Kachina um, has these supernatural aspects. And the dolls are likenesses of the Kachinas that have the spirit inside of them. So they aren't simply dolls, they are spirits of the world that are captured in these objects. And think about the relation of that as we talked about Egypt a few moments ago and how the idea of, in the case of Akhenaten, he believes that the object, of the, the sphere, the um, plasma of the sun is a god, not something that is invisible. Um, and that is certainly, I think, similar possibly in terms of thinking about the spirits or animism in Kachinas, in Zuni uh, mythology. And then the two last things that our chapter goes over, it's a lot, right? And again, we're not getting deep into anything. We're just getting the surface. We're kind of getting the, um, the narrative of how it all fits together in our textbook. 
Um, and it's still almost 500 pages long. Um, so we're getting a little bit of things. I'm giving you extra information or different information in these lectures. And I'm also giving you links to give you um, to go even deeper into these subjects. So as deep as you want to go is really up to you based on how you want to use these PDFs. India, which starts in the textbook on page 26 and 27. So we find in another river valley, again, fresh water. Um, we find some older civilizations in the Indus Valley, like Mohenjo-Daro, where we have the ruins of a gridded out city with um, bathing facilities, covered drains, sewage systems. And from the Indus Valley, we are also seeing early art, like this seal here. So this um, seal would have been pressed into clay. I showed you that in Sumerian religions, an example of what the clay pressing would have looked like. So here we're seeing, we have titled this a yogi. We have not translated the language from the Indus Valley, but we think that this might be a version of the Hindu god Shiva. Three different faces wearing a headdress with these horns. Shiva is known as the Lord of the Beasts. And I've mentioned that idea of Lord of the Beasts going back to the Neolithic era. So in a meditative um, cross-legged pose on this dais here, the animals surround the three-faced image, probably of a god. From the Vedic period, from 1500 to 322 BC, about 3,500 years ago to around 3,000 years ago, we get this new um, uh, uh, culture of the, uh, um, of the Indo-Aryan culture. And from this, we're going to get the oral uh, um, transmissions that will be written down into Sanskrit of the Vedas. So the Vedas are a number of Hindu epics. Um, the uh, Vedas is credited to the god Brahma as the writer. And in the Vedas, we get the Upanishads, which discuss meditation, philosophy, and spiritual knowledge. So Hinduism is one of the oldest religions from the Vedas, from the Vedic era. Um, and from the Vedic writings. Um, this is a religion that is using karma and dharma and has major gods like Shiva and Vishnu. Um, so in the Trimudi, the three major gods that we find in Hinduism, Brahma is generally not a physical manifestation, but is considered to be the author of the Vedas. Um, Vishnu is the, the, uh, is the preserver, and Shiva is the transformer and destroyer. Very often it is Shiva who is worshipped as the main gods, and the other gods are seen as avatars or part of Shiva. The same thing could be true with Vishnu as well. Here we are looking at Lord Krishna Vishnu, um, advising Arjuna, and this would be in the tale of the Bhagavad Gita here. The Bhagavad Gita is taking place on a battlefield. Um, this is a philosophy and a religious text that is explaining Dharma and Karma to a warrior. So what is this Dharma and Karma? Well, dharma is what your responsibilities are. And your responsibilities have been figured out by the Vedic tradition in India by a caste system. That there are four castes, Brahmins, priests, warriors, skilled traders and merchants, and unskilled workers. And you fit into one of those castes and generally you are not allowed to transfer from one caste to another. So you have responsibilities or dharma. 
and that you have to live the, re the right ways. And if you live the right ways according to your dharma, your karma um, will uh, re re increase. So your actions, your karma is kind of like a cosmic tally book. And in Hinduism, what you're trying to do is you are trying to release your Atman. So in the universe, we have Brahman, which is the creative spirit, the creative essence of the entire universe. And that creative essence, you have a small part of it inside of you, the Atman. And that Atman is put into every time your body dies, your Atman goes into a new body. You are reincarnated into a new body. Very different than this, um, the idea of the soul in Christianity where your soul is a original creation that ends with or that um, uh, ends with your body into another world. Um, in this particular idea, your Atman is something that goes with you from body to body. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to do the right things in your caste to have better karma so you can, when you're reborn, you're born into a higher form and eventually you are never reborn. Your Atman, if you do well, if you do right, if your karma is good, your Atman is released back into the Brahman, uh, back into the universe. And so the Bhagavad Gita is about this warrior who is worried about karma and dharma because if I kill, isn't that going to mean that I'm going to have lower karma? And ultimately here, what um, Vishnu is doing, Vishnu is letting our warrior know, our, our prince um, Arjuna, Arjuna is letting the prince know that sometimes as a warrior you have to kill. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person necessarily by doing that. It doesn't necessarily, sometimes it's good because of your dharma and your responsibility that you might be saving more people that uh, uh, by killing and that maybe increases your karma. Okay, and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about in our lecture, uh, page 28 through 30, is some of the stuff happening spiritually uh, with ancient China. So in China, we find written records uh, as early as 3,000 years ago. Um, we find much of the cu culture um, unified under the Shang Dynasty, starting in 1700 BC. And then we find culture, literature, and philosophy developed under the Zhou Dynasty, starting around 3,000 years ago to about 2,000 years ago. Chinese calligraphy, Chinese writing, is mythologically uh, assigned to Fu Shi, a, um, a Chinese legend who may or may not have existed. Um, and the, uh, um, is credited with the invention of hunting, fishing, cooking, and also the style of Chinese writing beginning in 12,000 BC. Probably that is not true, not actual. I don't think that Chinese writing developed 9,000 years before writing um, from the Sumerians and from the Egyptians. I suspect probably developed around the same time period. So Chinese culture is also developing around rivers, the Yangtze and the Yellow River. In the same way in India, they're developing around the Indus River. In Egypt, the Nile. In Mesopotamia, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Fresh water coming out of mountains is helping us to thrive, to create thriving civilizations. From the Zhou Dynasty, we get this really interesting idea, the mandate of heaven, 
that roughly 200 to 350 years is about how long a dynasty will last. In other words, you get a new dynasty, they have new ideas, everything's really fresh, and then their sons aren't as good as a ruler, their grandsons are kind of lazy, and their great-grandsons, well, they stink. So about every 250 to 350 years, you will have a revolution and a change of dynasties because that's the way it works. It is a mandate of heaven. The Zhou dynasty talks about this. In the Zhou dynasty, we also see an interesting Chu state um, from the Yangtze Valley in the Zhou dynasty. Or in other words, from the Chu, what we're seeing is the shaman religion still. And then the other religion that is developing is Taoism. And in Taoism, what we have is basically a relationship to nature, health for your body. Um, with, um, uh, with Taoism, uh, what we have is a... Um, a world where uh, um, there is a spiritual, supernatural world where you as a human are trying to find your place in this world. And if you find your way, your path, your principle, that you will flow down the world effortlessly like flowing down a river. Um, and so in Taoism, we are trying to find a way through studying and being with nature, understanding naturalness, understanding the idea of quiet, simplicity, spontaneity, rather than intellectualism. The three treasures that we find in Taoism are compassion, moderation, and humility. So in other words, you need to align yourself with the cosmic forces, and that path will present a way for you to find your way in life. I think maybe one of the more interesting things to end the lecture today is through ancestor worship. So in China, we find a very active ancestor worship. You'll find it in Chinese restaurants, Chinatown. You'll find it all over um, Far East Asian culture. So here we're seeing food laid out. We're seeing candles lit. Incense might be lit at this grave here. So ancestor worship, you believe that your deceased family members have a continual existence in the afterlife and that they will look after your family. And they will look after your family as long as you remember them as long as you remember the things that they've done, how they've got you to this point that you're at. Think about that. Think how many people have died and done things for you to be where you are sitting today in this lecture. All the people who have made things and survived and created children and created lives that allow you to be where you're at. And your job as the living is to remember that unbroken chain of DNA that has led to you. So there's a lot here, but there's some pretty interesting things, isn't there? Right? Like there's some really cool stuff here, I think. Um, from, and think about what we've studied so far. And I'm just going to just, just kind of quickly just talk about, I think, some of the best of this. So we have learned how early human beings use tools made art, maybe how music operated through the shamans, through a relationship to nature and the cosmos and a spiritual world, and that th all things have spirits, even rocks have spirits. We saw a development into the Neolithic where we learned how to farm, and we see new ideas of fertility goddesses, and by the time that we have the Bronze Age and Mesopotamia, we are looking at writing. And we now have really complex gods and an afterlife that we find written about in Mesopotamia. And gods that all have different physical characteristics. Sun gods, fertility gods, gods of war, women as fertility gods in Inanna. 
And then we go into Egypt, where we have this amazingly conceived afterlife, an afterlife that could be on Netflix as a television show or a film. How amazingly creative uh, of us to come up with something like this. And then in India, we get an a idea of the soul. And we've seen a, a, a monotheistic religion develop in Persia. Where in Zoroastria, Zoroastrianism, um, we are getting a notion of a single God, um, of judgment after death, of heaven and hell and angels. In India, we are getting this notion of a soul and regeneration or rebirth of this Atman, of this creative energy within us. And the idea that we have karma and dharma. We have responsibilities and we also should try to do good in the world rather than evil. Why? Because A, it's fun to do good and to help people, but it also helps you in the spiritual realm as well. And in China, we are finding now a religion based on nature uh, a religion based on meditation and spirituality. As a Taoist, you learn how to, how to listen to silence. As a Taoist, you learn that inaction is an action. You learn how to be still. Very useful stuff in terms of meditation. And then, of course, our ancestors are actively involved in our lives here on Earth as long as as we venerate them, as long as we honorate them. Okay, so from reading that chapter, I've kind of gone over what I think are important parts of the chapter, and I've added things in in a couple of illustrated lectures that have links to them. Your job is to take the quiz and to do the assessment um, by next week. And then the last thing we're going to have is a discussion. And I'm going to go over this kind of quickly here. So in our discussion, we are going to discuss cave art. And we've looked at this a little bit, right? Like we've seen this image from the beginning of the Paleolithic era. And I show you a Paleolithic reconstruction of a human being here. I also talk briefly about how Neanderthals apparently made art. So we discovered that another form of human, Neanderthal, not modern humans, us, homo sapien thinking humans, but also Neanderthals who lived side by side with us up until 30,000 years ago. So they were living in Europe and Asia. Um, when humans, modern humans get to Asia 40,000 years ago, we were sharing um, uh, Europe, uh, we were sharing Europe with the, um, uh, the Neanderthals, and about 10,000 years ago, they die out. We don't know why exactly. We are the only species of uh, human beings left. There were many other ones before us and multiple ones that lived with us, but we're the ones that have survived. We find, though, in a cave, the disks and this ladder that we have been able to date at 65,000 years ago in Spain. And yet, we don't have any evidence of modern humans there until 40,000 years ago. So who could have painted this 25,000 years ago before we were there? And the only answer that we can kind of come up with is probably Neanderthal. So this means that we aren't the only type of human being that had the ability to draw, to make things. And that's something that is really interesting, I think, in considering human beings. We're going to study the cave paintings and the idea of how these paintings might have spiritual properties to them or how they were created by the cave a little bit themselves. How on the horses, it's the seeing the head as a horse or down here on this ibex, on this ram uh, drawn in this beautiful red pigment. 
we see the horn, we see the tail, the back, the back leg, but notice they don't draw the bottom part here. Instead, these natural formations from water making rock on the, on the cave wall, it looks like with the shadows, like the ram is running. It looks like it's walking. So if I move the torchlight and the shadows are changing, it's going to look like this thing is animated. We see a lot of that in these cave paintings. Certainly, we see in Chevy some of the great artwork of the Paleolithic era. I'm going to take you through Chevy in a couple of moments. Now, Chevy is 30,000 um, to around 20,000 years ago, and then it was sealed by a landslide. The oldest painting up until we discovered uh, a Chevy um, was 17th. So we doubled back in time how far this went in 1994. Until then, we thought Lascaux was the oldest painting in France. And in Lascaux, we have these giant images of cows. We also have an image of a human being in Lascaux as well, too. Talked about the Venus. I, of course, have talked about shamanism. And I want to talk about the painting maybe as a type of shamanism as well. And I certainly talked about the Kachinas too. So in this lecture, you see things that I've repeated from the earlier lecture. And then am putting it into a discussion for us. Okay. So for this discussion, you get four points for answering the three questions. One point for commenting on a fellow student's post. I would like you to review the lecture of Cave Art and the Shaman. This is about art as magic or magic as a ritual to project the future, heal, or do something supernatural. That could very well be. I talk about artists maybe being shaman. So that dancer that we saw may, may be a shaman. The magic of creating an image on a wall and that image having some spiritual property. If you want to see another video of a shaman, I have one in the lecture that we saw. I have a different one here. If you want to keep kind of getting what are these shaman. Also, you should see what a cave looks like. And I'm going to take you through Don's maps next. Also, Google Arts and Culture has a great experience into cave art. Um, and then I think you should watch the last 10 minutes of this TED video from Guinevere von Petzinger. She is one of the best, I think, uh, archaeologists studying cave art right now. So let's look at Chevy first. This is Don's Maps. I have this open for you. So when you hit that link, you will open in Chevy Cave, and this is Don's Maps. Don is a retired math teacher from Australia. For the last 30 years, he's put together the best free website of cave art and Paleolithic art anywhere on the internet that you'll find. This is an amazing collection. Nothing else is close to this. I don't even think you could publish this because there's so many images it would be so expensive to do. So in Chevy, we have what is considered to be the great mural of the Paleolithic world, the mural with these cave lions that are intensely focused on these other animals from an extinct bestiary here. So they're looking at woolly mammoths. They're looking at um, um, woolly rhinoceros. Um, and we also have a giant ibex here with three back legs implying movement. We saw that with the, um, uh, uh, we saw that with the sculpture from the Assyrians in the last lecture. We see here a woolly rhinoceros with a number of horns and a number of different back lines, maybe implying that it's moving. So Chevy, Don's maps, Don shows us where the cave was discovered. And what I love about this, not just one picture, we get to see all these different angles from the Ardiche. And he makes maps. 
He shows us where they were walking when they discovered the cave. We get to see the entrance into the cave. He has a map that shows us how they had to repel in total darkness into the cave to get into the chamber. This was probably the old entrance that was sealed 20,000 years ago. They get into the cave and they see the blown disks. They see geometric um, configurations that are totally lost on us in terms of their meaning. And there is so much art in here. This cave bear with the ears that are in a perspective, how beautifully done the snout is here. And how the shoulder blade is an outcropping in the rock. The shoulder may have been the beginning of this drawing. Seeing the shoulder blade may have led to the rest of the animal, possibly. We see what a cave bear looks like. I love Don so much. Cave bears um, occupied this cave about 100,000 years before the humans started entering it and had stopped maybe about 10,000 years uh, before humans were entering it, or 1,000 years at least. That's that there, we, we are not with the cave bears at the time we're painting here, is the general belief. But there are lots of bones of cave bears and things like that in here for sure. Now, other art is made by finger fluting. So by taking your finger and just putting it into the walls of the cave that are soft from all the water getting into the cave. Horses, woolly mammoths, again, really amazing stuff. I think the paintings later on in the cave, like the um, paintings of the horses, are some of the most beautiful drawings that I've ever seen of horses. And then as we continue to go into the cave, you just, you know, here is the woolly rhinoceros that I showed you earlier. And at the very end, notice how I'm just scanning through all of this. At the very end, we get to the great mural with the cave lions. And we see how much character there is in each one of the faces. The mouths are all different. Their look on their face is all very different. And then the last thing in this cave that I wanted to talk about that I'll take us into the discussion from. So there are no human images in Chevy. There is a half-human image, though. This half-human image is hanging on this rock called a pendant. And what we find is a human body with a buffalo or a deer's head. And then we find female genitalia on the back of a lion here. So what are these half woman, half lion, maybe half man, half buffalo? What are these images? And again, as I talked about earlier, we kind of think these images might be of shaman, might be religious, and that possibly what's happening in these caves might be some sort of religious ceremony. That is the reason they're going into these dark caves, that they are hallucinating and they are creating animals based on things that they're seeing in the cave and coming out spiritually transformed. Not that different from dancing around the fire at night. So the questions for you after you go over the materials are here. Why is the half man, half animal motif so common in the ancient world? Why do you think so? And if we look at early written records about gods and goddesses, why do you think that they're so often associated with an animal? Give an example from the chapter. And then do you think that the role of the shaman is the beginning of religion? Um, it certainly might be the beginning of religion in terms of what we have in terms of writing um, and art uh, and sculpture made in the service of religion. But we don't know exactly because we don't have writing from the Paleolithic era. Now, why do the Paleolithic artists spend so much time painting animals? And one way to think about this is an article from Cognitive Psychology that I found that says part of the reason that maybe we painted those animals is that we're hardwired when we see shadows to misinterpret them as animals. 
and that it might be to our advantage to misinterpret a shadow as a bear than to not see a bear and to be eaten by a bear. Um, and certainly that might explain something, that there is a biological response to seeing animals in shadows that these artists might be taking advantage of and that are ultimately um, recreating the human mind by doing that. At the very end, I talk about how I use some Paleolithic study to make art myself, to try to understand it better. Okay, so this is our first class. Um, you have a lecture that I've gone over and a five-question quiz. You have a chapter that I have gone over in a lecture. I have a supplemental lecture. They're all illustrated and full of links. You will have a 10-question quiz on chapter one, and then you have an assessment to do on chapter one. Then you're going to consider cave art and the shaman, um, and you're going to have a discussion on that for five points. So we have a total of 25 points for this week. All the assignments will be due um, by the end of this week. And then starting next week, um, I will um, give you um, a announcement, um, and there will be a new lecture that I will also go over the material with you. So thank you for joining me for our first class for Introduction um, to the Humanities. Um, again, I welcome everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy the journey. Um, I hope you recognize how much I enjoy uh, talking about and looking at um, uh, all of this stuff. Because to me, it makes me um, connected to uh, the history of human production in really kind of profound ways. So I'll talk to you next week, everybody. Bye-bye.